Timothy in chapter 3. We'll pick up here in verse 16. The Bible says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, the Bible here, it says that all the Scriptures, whether you you know, from Genesis to Revelation, all the scriptures are there and they're useful and they're useful to teach us, which means you've absolutely got to change your mind if you want to have the God experience. So many times we, we, we open the Bible and we've already decided what we believe. And we read the scriptures and, and we're hoping for God to do something great in our lives, 
Christ, but we're not willing to change our minds and be taught by God. And so what happens is we don't really ever change. We go through the motions, but we're still the same people. Because we're holding on to something different than God. My question to you this morning is, what are you holding on different than God? What are you unwilling to let go of? Because the scriptures are supposed to be there, and they're useful to teach us to be different. That means our minds have to change. Our priorities got to change. When we see what the Bible teaches, we say, hey, I'm willing to learn, which means if you're there to learn, it means you admit that you don't know what's right, that God knows what's right. And for, so you, for you to have the God experience, you've got to be committed to changing according to what the Bible teaches. You know, in Psalm 86, we don't have to go there, but you can write down verses 11 and 12. David, he says, teach me your way. Teach me your way, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. You know, David knew that if he was going to come to God, and he's known as a man who is truly after God's own heart. He said, I know if I'm going to come to God, I've got to come with a learner's perspective. My perspective has got to be, God, teach me your way. Give me a heart that's undivided. And I'll walk in your faithfulness. Is that you this morning? Just show me the scriptures, you know. Show me what the Bible says and I'm willing to change. Even if it's challenging. Even if it's hard. Even if it's what I've believed my whole life. Just show me I'm willing to change. This is the heart of David. And it's got to be the heart of a true disciple of Jesus. You know, the next way that the scriptures are used is to correct and rebuke. You know, we live in a world that, that doesn't like to be corrected. We live in a religious world that just wants to, to keep doing what it's doing and slap Jesus on it. And, and Jesus knows, I'm going to keep living my life, but I'm going to talk about Jesus. And then the, the scriptures come in people's lives to correct them and to rebuke them, and they get flat ticked off. Yeah. People just get mad when the Bible comes into their life. <laughs> Flat out that. I mean, the heart of David, if you read Psalm 141, verse 5. In Psalm 141, and verse 5, the Bible says, Let a righteous man rebuke me. That is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. This guy was totally willing to be changed by the Word of God. My question to you is this morning, is there anything in your life right now you're not willing to change. Are you willing to let the Word of God correct you? For God to pull you in as the counselor and the teacher to say, hey, come into my office, right? He's going to pull out the Word of God. And He's going to say, this is what needs to change in your life. And we've got a lot of correction in our life. See, the Bible wasn't meant to uh, build nice buildings. The Bible wasn't built to uh, buy private jets. That's not why the Bible was, was given to us. The Bible was actually given to us that it would actually change our lives. It would change our minds. It would change our actions. It would change who we are. It would change what we believe, the message we invest in, and what we preach to the entire world. And for us to have the God experience, it starts with you. If you want the world to change, you first have got to change yourself according to the Word of God. The Bible is meant to train us. I think of, uh, I appreciate Courtney talking about the, uh, the Ducks football, you know, I, I mean, they give up finances for Ducks football, you give up your best of your health, you give up your creativity, your time, your, your opportunities, and you're devoted to training and, and, and football. And God's perspective is that you should give up everything to train in the Word of God. Yeah. But we live in a world that says you don't really need to train in, tra train in the Word of God. Just believe. Come to an altar call, you'll be good. And you don't really need to train in the Word of God. That's not God's perspective. God's perspective is that the Scriptures are here so that we would learn, we'd be corrected, we'd be even rebuked, and we would train in the very words of God. You know, this is God's vision for your life. And when, when you take on this vision for yourself, the Bible says in verse 17 that you will grow closer and closer to being thoroughly equipped, that you'll be ready for every good work, that you know how to talk to people from all over the world, that you know how to talk to people from all different kind of backgrounds. When the Word of God is what you trained in and you've had the real God experience, you'll be equipped for every good work in this life. Amen. Because the truth is, when the Bible is open, the most powerful message in the world is preached. This is the most powerful message in the world. Yeah. It's from the heart of God. 
And it's given to the heart of people, but we've got to fully accept it. You know, lives change when the Word of God is preached. Yeah. Hearts are moved. Hearts are revealed. Faith is built. Convictions are built. It's strengthened and it's growth. And it's even birthed when the Word of God is preached. Yeah. At the same time, persecution is coming. Because the truth is that people, all, all people don't want to hear the Word of God. But for us to have the God experience, we've got to fully embrace it. And God is glorified when the Word of God is preached. And the Word of God is going to get preached here this morning. Amen. 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 The title of our lesson this morning is the God experience. You know, point number one is wherever you are, it's time to step up. Wherever you are, it's time to step up. You know, the height of the glory of Israel is when David was king. And it was amazing when David was king because he ruled over as a, as a man who had God's own heart and, and he ruled as king. And, and David wasn't always king though. But let's see when he was brought in to be the king. Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 11. 1 Chronicles here in chapter 11. We're going to see that David becomes king over Israel. In verse 1, the Bible says, All Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, he made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel as the Lord had promised through Samuel. I mean, here was a glorious moment. I mean, David, he's anointed as king over Israel. And you may say, well, wherever you are, it's time to step up. But David was king. No wonder David stepped up. But you know who David was before he was a king? He was a little shepherd boy. In fact, they were choosing the king, and his dad didn't even think it fit for, for him to be a choice. His dad said, definitely not David. <laughs> Everybody else except for David. And David was out tending the sheep. His heart was to be committed to what his home was. And he says, anytime there was a bear, there was a, an animal trying to, to, to destroy the sheep, he said, I, I, got, I came up and I fought it. And, and, and it came the time when, you know, when nobody was watching, David was still an honorable man. Nobody's watching the sheep, you know? And, and David says, I'm willing to put my life down to protect the sheep because this is my God-given responsibility. He wasn't comparing himself to another king or to somebody else. He says, where does God have me right now? And I'm going to fulfill the duties that God has given me. Come on. Nobody saw him fight the, the bear. Whatever the sound was. But he fought. And he protected the sheep. You know, he used this conviction to be able to share in front of the whole army of Israel at one point. Remember when Goliath came forward and Goliath was just defaming Israel and, and, and David, the little shepherd boy, came up and he says, look, I'll go. And people are like, yeah, right. You're not going to do anything. And David says, no, no. While I've been alone in my times, alone, I've been walking with God and I've been doing things on, on faith and I've been, I've been brave and I've been growing. Give me a shot at this guy. And David goes forward and he says, God is going to get the victory. The whole world's going to know about God. And then David slings down with a stone and he takes out Goliath. This is all before he became the king. Then David started leading military campaigns. He took initiative to lead. See, it didn't matter what stage in David's life he was. He said, wherever I am, I'm going to step up for God. You know, where does God have you right now? Maybe you feel like, man, I'm not the preacher, so I'm not really important. I'm not the Bible talk leader. I'm not discipling anybody. I'm not, I'm not the best teacher of the scriptures. It doesn't matter where you're at. Wherever you're at, you can step up right now, and you can be faithful to God, and you watch God move, and you get humble, and you say, you know what, wherever I am right now, I'm going to step up for God, and I'm going to watch God work in my life. And at the right moments, I'm going to step up on faith. And I'm going to put my heart out there. And I'm just going to watch what God has in store for my life. Yeah, yeah. Come on, bro. Well, David became king after he decided to step up wherever he was. See, God has big plans for everybody. 
But the question is, are you stepping up where you are right now? Let's pick up in 1 Chronicles 11, verse 4. It says, David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem, that is Jebus. The Jebusites who lived there said to David, You will not get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. David had said, Whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become a commander in chief. Joab, son of Zariah, went up first, and so received the command. David then took up residence in the fortress, and so it was called the city of David. He built up the city around it from the supporting terraces to the surrounding wall, while Joab restored the rest of the city. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with him. Verse 10, these were the chiefs of David's mighty men. They, together with all Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land as the Lord had promised. This is the list of David's mighty men. I mean, what a glorious moment. I mean, here's, here's David, and he becomes the king, and, and right as he becomes king, everybody's so excited. No, he faces opposition right away. The first is to go get the city, and, and, and immediately people say, you can't do it. You know, do you, do you get faithless when people doubt? Maybe you say, in your position where you're at, and you've decided you're going to step up, but you know what? Somebody says negative stuff. Maybe you get some sort of persecution. You get that little voice inside of your head that says you're not good enough. What's the point of trying? This isn't where you come from. Nevertheless, David said, no, we're going to go capture the city. I don't have time to listen to the unfaithful people. I'm a man of faith. And I'm going to walk with God because this is where God has me. And I'm going to lead the people in a powerful way. I believe that right here we see the ABCs of leadership. As David conquers the city. Well, I believe the A is he was anchored in the Lord. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says that David became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with them. The ABCs of leadership is, well, first, A, you've got to be anchored in the Lord. I gotta ask you, are you anchored in the Lord each day? When you wake up, do you spend time with God or is class more important? Do you spend time with God or is breakfast more important? Do you spend time with God or are the worries of the day already overwhelming your life? And so you're not really anchored in God, you're anchored in the world. The reason that David was able to do such feats was he was anchored in God. It says the reason he was so successful and he grew powerful. Because he walked with God. You know, so many of us, we, we put walking with God as a, a third, fourth, fifth priority. We put money, we put school, we put the words of this life, even desires for other things, way ahead of God. And we wonder, why is our life not changing? Well, we just got to get anchored in the Lord. Why do we have quiet times every day to get anchored in the Lord? Come on. Yeah. Come on. Why, do we, why do we pray daily to God? Because we need to get anchored in the Lord. And when we're anchored in the Lord, God's going to do great things in our life. Amen. Well, B. Well, before we get to B, I mean, let's talk about college. Oh, college does not teach you to be anchored in the Lord. Come on. College teaches you to be anchored in parties, be anchored in impure relationships, be anchored in drugs, be anchored in idolatry of school, idolatry of career, be anchored in the fear of just planning and worrying about tomorrow. And if we would just get anchored in the Lord, if we would radically put God above school, above relationships, above even our own futures, God would build our future. He'd build our relationships. He'd open the right doors for us. But we first got to get anchored in the Lord. Yeah. Well, B, he believed it could be done. Look at, look at verse 4. It says, David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem. That is Jebus. The Jebusites who lived there said to David, You will not get in here, nevertheless. David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. I mean, he believed the Lord. Yeah. And when you're anchored, you can't help but believe. Yeah. And we understand that when we believe, it produces faith. And when faith is produced, man, great things happen. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I think that's, a, that's something we should adopt as a church. You know, we should say, you know what? Finances are challenging, persecutions out there, you know, the, the weather's groggy, but nevertheless, we're going to believe the Lord. Uh, times are hard, I don't feel good, but nevertheless, I'm going to go preach the Word. I mean, David had a nevertheless attitude. 
you know? And, and he believed. And so he became a great leader in the Lord. You know, we've got to believe that that the disciples will have, always have people that speak against us. There's always going to be naysayers. We have a huge enemy. His name's Satan. Doesn't want us to be successful. And we've got to fight the good fight of being faithful. You know, how are we going to grow the church? Nevertheless, we're going to keep preaching the word. Come on. Come on. I mean, how are we going to raise missions? Nevertheless, we're going to keep raising missions. Come on. I mean, you may ask, how are we going to raise up great leaders? <laughs> Nevertheless, we're going to preach the word, and God's going to bring great leaders into the kingdom, and people are going to rise up. And the Lord. Come on. You know, as a perspective, is your glass half full or half empty? You know, I believe if we live with a half full mentality, we'd be grateful for what we have. When the glass is half full, you say, man, I've got this, I've got this, this is awesome, this is what I'm grateful for. But when the glass is half empty, you're like, yeah, I have all this, but I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this, and I don't have this. Right. And it's so, that's why worry is just flat out sin in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. My challenge to the church is if you have a half empty mentality, it's time to repent. Yeah. We've got to look at what God's given us, we've got to be grateful for it, and we've got to be fired up to do the work of the Lord. Yeah. Come on. C. What's the C of leadership? He called others to leadership as well. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Well, let's look at verse 6. It says, David said, whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become commander-in-chief. Joab, son of Zariah, went up first, and so received the command. You know, David said, you know what? We need other leaders to rise up. And he called people to it, and, and he didn't just tell people what to do. You do this, you do this, you do this. That's not the type of leadership in the kingdom of God. The type of leadership in the kingdom of God is to preach the needs, is to preach what the vision is, and God is going to raise up people, and people are going to step up, and people are going to get trained, and many more people are going to be great leaders in the kingdom of God. Amen. Well, let's look at some of these men who stepped up. Let's look at the parallel passage in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Yeah. The ABCs of leadership. Because wherever you are, it's time to step up. Yeah. 2 Samuel 23. We'll pick up here at verse 8. Give me an amen when you guys are there. Amen. 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 Awesome. Verse 8, it says, These are the names of David's mighty men. Joseph, Bashtabeth, a Takimonite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men, whom he killed in one encounter. I mean, what a beast. Amen. We know that we don't live in a physical army anymore, so yeah. we're not going to physically inflict oh. harm on people. Amen. We live in a spiritual army today, and so we're, our battle is not against people, it's actually against the spiritual forces of, yeah. of wickedness in this world, and so the way that we step up and we take out 800 demons is by preaching the word of God yeah. and calling people to repent of their own lives yeah. and get baptized into the kingdom. Yeah. That's the army that we've got to raise up and the battle we've got to fight today. Yeah. Nevertheless, this guy was a beast. <laughs> Verse 9, it says, Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Ahoy. Oh, oh, As one of the three mighty men, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines, gathered at Pastamim, for battle. Then the men of Israel retreated, but he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines, till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. You know, when you study out Eleazar, Eleazar was a guy who refused to give up his convictions. Yeah. Here they war, they, they went to war, and, and what happened? The whole Israelite camp fled. When you read the parallel passage in 1 Chronicles 11, it says that Eleazar stood by David's side. And Eleazar and David went to battle. I mean, this was a guy who said, I've got convictions. I'm willing to stand up. I'm willing to get behind leadership. I'm willing to fight the fight even if other people walk away. My convictions are to still be here and to trust God. Yeah, come on. This guy loved the battle. And he couldn't wait to fight it with David. And bottom line, this guy was loyal. Yeah. You've got to ask yourself, are you loyal to those that God has put in your life? How are we going to advance and how are we going to help really win over people? We've got to become loyal to them. I mean, this guy became one of David's mighty men because he was side by side with him. 
He says, I'm with you, I'll fight with you, and I'm going to keep the convictions that you have. And they fought together. And you know, I think of loyalty, I think of heroes like Stephen and Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. I think of a guy like Tony, who's been around for 10 years. I think of Marvin and Natalie. I, I, I think of so many of the disciples. I mean, Everett and Raina, I mean, that have stood on the ground with their convictions yeah. no matter what's been going on. Right. And yes, sometimes we get shook and, and things happen, but we say, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm standing right here, I'm still fighting, and we're going to win this war for God Almighty. Come, Come on. on. Pick up in verse 11. The Bible said, next to him was Shema, son of Agi, the Herahite. When the Philistines banded together a place, there, were the, there was a field full of lentils. Israel's troops fled from them, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and shook the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. You know, there's been so many people that have preached so many incredible messages. And over time, we've talked about so much, but... But unlike Shema, I mean, Shema's here in the battlefield. His back's exposed, his sides are exposed, his front's exposed, and he says, I'm still here to fight, even if it's just me. This guy was a mighty man because of his example. And you got to ask yourself, if everybody else walked away, would you still be here? Yeah. That's the loyalty we're called to build first with Jesus yeah. and God Almighty, but also we're called to fight like God before. You know, the sin of the Pacific Northwest is, is that there's no conviction to have convictions. That's the sin of the Northwest. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Hill and I would always joke around about how, you know, the Northwest is kind of like you get to a, like a four-way stop. And, uh, and you're like, no, you go. And they're like, oh, I couldn't. You go. No, 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 you should, you should probably go. No, you should go. No, I, I would just feel bad. I think you should go. And they, they put their cars in park, and they get out and they say, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just want us to be friends. We're friends, right? Yeah, yeah, we're friends. Okay, you should go. No, you, okay. I'll go just so we can keep going. That's the Northwest. That's <laughs> true. Just be nice. You're welcome. As long as you don't have convictions. You're welcome to be around and to be with everybody as long as you don't start standing up for something. Yeah. Yeah. Don't bring that Jesus stuff here about full commitment. Don't bring that kind of stuff about giving up everything and, and preaching against sin. Don't do that. That actually offends me. That's not the kingdom that we're building. We're not building the kingdom of the Northwest. We're building the kingdom that Spencer painted in communion when Jesus went to the cross, when he set us free. And so therefore we preach because we yes. believe and we want to see more people set free as well. Yeah. Well, let's pick up here in verse 13. It says, During harvest time, three of the thirty chief men came down to David at the cave of Adalom, and while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephim. At the time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. It is not, is it not? Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Wow. I mean, these mighty men had guts. And they were brave, and they weren't concerned about, you know, if they were here today, they wouldn't be concerned about going to campus and preaching the word. They wouldn't be concerned about going to their job and sharing their faith. They wouldn't be concerned if they were in an, a, a, an ungodly relationship to say, hey, it's not worth it. I'm standing up for my God. I'm not here to, to just please people. I'm here to please God. Yeah. And this was the exploits. They said, I'm loyal to the kingdom. I'm loyal to what we're building. And we're going to see God move in a powerful way. And then David dumps out the water. <laughs> Were they offended? No. Their conviction was to serve. You know, I think a lot of times where people get heart sick is, is their conviction is not really to serve. Their conviction is to see the satisfaction they get when somebody enjoys what they did. And sadly, that will lead to bitterness down the road. And bitterness, will it's, it's this disease that haunts and destroys and kills you. Spiritually. Uh, 
I gave somebody a gift one time, and uh, you know, I was at like a some like a fellowship or something, and I put some thought into it, and then after the meeting was over, the gift was still there on the table, and I was like, I felt a little bit hurt to be honest, <laughs> but then I was like, I didn't give my gift so that I could feel happy about giving the gift. Mm -hmm. I give a gift because I care about. It. And I believe when we have that mindset is that we have the conviction to serve, it doesn't matter how people respond. Yeah. When we study the Bible with people, you know what, there's going to be people that we pour hours and hours and days and our hearts and our tears and our efforts into. Yeah. And they're going to walk away. Yeah. It's not about the result. Yeah. It's about us responding in faith to God. It's about us serving because we have the conviction to serve. It's about us going after it and trusting God. And as we are willing to stand alone, we'll see God bring a great victory. You know, but David and his men were mighty because they stepped up to the call. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you've been studying the Bible. And you know that you need to become a disciple and you need to get baptized and you need to walk and live as a disciple of Jesus. And you're just scared to step up. It's okay. That's where Paul was. Paul was scared to step up. I was scared to step up. Yeah. You talk to so many people who have stepped up and become disciples. They were scared to step up. My challenge to you is step up, study the Bible, become a disciple, get baptized, and come fight this fight with us. Together. Amen. Come on. Come on. Maybe you've answered the call. Maybe you've already been baptized. And you've, you're, you, you know, you, you've been a disciple and you've just kind of been hanging out. What do you need to step up in? Have you taken the fight for someone challenge to heart? Our campaign, the fight for someone. You know, I, I appreciate Carissa shared good news the other day. And she, she shared about this incredible Asian woman, Phoebe. And she said, and, and that's who I'm fighting for. And she sat down. And I was like, that's awesome. The hardest, we've got somebody we're fighting for. You know, it's been amazing seeing Kareem really fight for Leslie, you know, and, and Spencer going after Caleb and pulling him and then, you know, Manuel with uh, with Kelvin, and I'm so excited for Josue to be here, and, and I'm just to see Jesse, and I know Stephen's been, I talked to Stephen, and he's like, man, I'm so excited for Jesse, he's going to come out to Bible talk, he's going to be at church, and, and to see Leslie, I mean, this is awesome, we're fighting for people, but maybe you're sitting here and you're not fighting for anybody. Wherever you are, it's time to step up. Yeah. And it's time to answer the call and watch God work through us powerfully. Mm -hmm. Point number two is, it's time to think globally and act locally. You know, Jesus absolutely instilled a global mindset into every single disciple he called to follow him. Let's look at it in Matthew 28. Each gospel writer records, records Jesus instilling a global vision into his followers. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, the Bible says that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Yeah, come on. Jesus didn't say, Stay in the confines of Jerusalem. He didn't say, go to Galilee and just settle in your small little town. He said, no, if you're going to follow me, you got to have the mindset that you're going to go make disciples of all the nations, that you're going to baptize, that you're going to teach people to be obedient, and they're going to become disciples of all nations with a worldwide mindset, because Jesus was teaching them to think globally. But in order to do that, they had to, they had to act locally. You know, for us, we've got to have more of a mindset than Eugene or small town or you know, I'm excited to, that, uh, you know, Everett Rayner are going to be going down to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, and oh, oh, oh. Because they're thinking way more than Eugene. You know, we're going to miss them dearly, but they're going to be incredible missionaries. Yeah. Do you think globally? Is your vision here in Eugene? Or do you have a worldwide mindset? You know, why do we give missions? Because we're not trying to just build a big church in Eugene. Yeah. We're, we're, we're actually sending money out to international third world congregations. To see what happened in Mexico City blows my mind. But why was that person's heart moved? And why is that church established? And why does the disciples in Mexico City now have a four-story church building? Because somebody was willing to give missions, and they were willing to give missions again, and again, and again, and the church rose up. And you know what? It wasn't too long ago that the church in Mexico City 
was hurt. And it was about 50 disciples. And now to hear they just had a service of 300 with 177 disciples. That is a result of the faith that we have in God and the giving of our missions contributions. Mark 16 and verse 15. The Bible says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. What is Jesus instilling? A global mission. Not a community church. A global mission. But in order to build a community church, you have to act locally, but have the vision to go globally. Well, let's look at John chapter 13. Here in verse 34. John 13, verse 34. Give me an amen when you guys are there. Amen. amen. The Bible says, The new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Yeah. What was Jesus instilling as you act locally? As you love one another, another locally, this is the message that is going to go global. And he was constantly expanding their vision. That you're not just a small town church, you're actually part of a worldwide mission. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and on Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah. I mean, Jesus throughout his entire ministry, at the end of his ministry, and then he goes up to heaven, he instills, it's a worldwide movement that's going to be built. It's not a local, just an, a, an autonomous group that's in a city, and then there's other people doing their thing in other cities. No, he says, build a worldwide movement that is going to reach the nations. You know, but you got to ask, is this your vision today? Mm. Are these where your hopes and dreams are? We're going to be giving missions contributions over and over until we meet Jesus, guys. Amen. Yeah. And we've just got to build a lifestyle of world missions. Absolutely. And if that's not our heart, we're going to get burnt out. Yeah. Yeah. If our heart is to give special missions to ourselves, and, and that's what we do in this life. We say, you know what, I'm going to save up this money and I'm going to buy, buy this nice big screen TV. And we get a special missions TV for ourselves. I'm going to save up all this money and special missions for me. I'm going to buy this new game console. And I'm going to buy all these new nice things. And I'm going to have my own special missions because I'm building my own kingdom. No, our mindset's got to be we're building God's kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're going to have special missions the rest of our lives as yeah. disciples. Does that mean that we can't live okay? And no, we can totally live and, and be in society. But it means don't put yourself or, or your lifestyle above the mission to reach the nation. Come on, bro. There it is. Yeah, come on. Mm -hmm. You know, and truthfully, to tell you the truth, I mean, it's happy to hear Eugene. I love being part of the Sold Out Movement. And I think you've got to ask yourself, do you absolutely love being part of a worldwide movement? Or does it scare you to think that people are going to persecute or people are going to say things against you? I'm fine with it. I love it. I love reading the Good News email. We spend this 25 minutes before service. I love that. I don't, I don't like standing still either. And I stood still and I was just fired up to listen. And that's not the first time I, I read those things. I mean, that was like the second or third time I read this stuff. And I'm still fired up because this is what we're a part of. It's Jesus' vision. I love going to global leadership conferences. I love, you know, going to Northwest Winter Workshop we're going to have and going to Winter Workshops and... And, and building a life to where I'm just more and more plugged in to what the movement of God is doing all over the world. But the truth is, it's happening right here. I look at this just this room. Caleb's from Singapore. Mm -hmm. Leslie's from Australia. Just ways from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yes. Calvin from Honduras. Woo. And many people from all over. Yes. And I say it's happening right here. Yes. We can reach all nations from Eugene. That we can start a movement and we can be able to build a movement and we can keep preaching the word. But what is it going to take? It's going to take us thinking globally, but acting locally and stepping up wherever you are. Yeah. Let's close out here in John chapter 4 as we wrap up our lesson. 
In John chapter 4, we'll look at how Jesus taught them to think locally, or to act locally, but to keep the vision of thinking globally. In John chapter 4, here in verse 35, the Bible says, Do you not say, four more months, and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crops for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the same one sows and another reaps is true. I send you to reap for what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you've reaped the benefits of their labor. In verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, I'm talking about Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Come on. Jesus says, open your eyes. Look locally. Look around. I mean, there's, there's people from all nations around here in Eugene. Act locally. Keep a, a world missions mindset. And know that the work that you put in now could be the very key to a new nation of the church plan. Could be the key to a, a new member of a, a, a mission team. Could be a key to a new remnant group. But we've got to open our eyes and see the harvest. You know, uh, as we wrap up here, uh, I'm so proud of Kelvin. And uh, that was amazing. Uh, we heard a lesson on a Friday night devotional about using your talents for God. And Jane takes this talent to heart and she says, you know what? I'm going to go play some soccer. And uh, Jane goes and she plays some soccer and she, she meets Kelvin and she invites Kelvin to church. And Kelvin comes out to church and, you know, Kelvin's a sharp guy. I remember the nice haircut he had. He was pretty much, had just pretty much come from Honduras. Is that right? Yeah. And he had a really nice haircut. <laughs> And we're like, no, where'd you get that haircut? He's like, from Honduras. <laughs> and, and I remember when Calvin first came out, and, and it was so amazing because we started studying the Bible. And seeing Manuel pulling in and start making meals, and we had Bible studies, and see the brothers come in and see him fellowshipping, and he started studying the scriptures. And Calvin has not had an easy life. He hasn't. I think here in the States, we, we, we make up so many excuses yeah. why we don't put God first. Yeah. And as Kelvin shared his life growing up in Honduras, I was, I was so moved just to hear that here's a guy who's, who's willing to hear the word of God. He's not using his past as a reason why God is not great. And so many times in America, people are, are unwilling to put God first because of their situation they grew up in. I don't think many people had a harder upbringing than Kelvin. And but this guy's got heart. Yeah. And uh, you know his passion and his vision through all that's happened in his life, he was he had a lot of passion and vision of just moving forward with so many things. And to see how God just routed him, you know, and, and routed his passion and vision straight towards the scriptures. <laughs> and to see Calvin just surrender in his heart to say, "Man, I see what the Bible teaches." And I remember he said. You show me what the Bible says, and I'll do what the Bible says. And he's been a man of his word. And Calvin said, you know what? I see that it's time to turn myself in. And to live under a new kingdom. And Calvin's here to be baptized today. As a
And I hope that you've got the conviction that wherever you are, it's time to step up. Yeah. And that you're willing to get out of maybe a small town where you're involved. Mm -hmm. And to think globally, and to act locally, because the fields are ripe and the harvest is plentiful. Amen, Amen guys? Amen. That's our lesson. Uh, we, are, we are a little bit over time, but this is a celebration today. Yeah. So if you do have uh, kids and kids' kingdom, please go at this time and get your kids. Uh, we're going to have a closing song, and then we're going to have the sharing of some of the brothers in Kelvin, and then we're going to see Kelvin get baptized in the Christ. Yeah. Yeah.